political speculations, which is a thing that I was doing last four years, uh, where I'm interested in um, designing for human-food interaction and the ways how uh, technologies are increasingly entering food cultures and how people are using technologies in their everyday food practices. Uh, and in the kind of design research that I do, I'm using specifically the methods of speculative fiction uh, and speculative design, which I guess is also the reason why I'm here today. Um, and I'm using these methods in everyday context. So I like to do participatory things rather than to exhibit my stuff in a gallery. I like to go on the street and, and work with the people on the ground, um, especially in sort of everyday life venues. Um, and really the goal of this whole like design research method is to support public engagement in food science and technology issues and bring it out of the academic classrooms of the galleries and just really bring the knowledge of food uh, on the street and get back the knowledge from everyday food practitioners, right? So kind of like blur the borders between who is food expert and who is food amateur. Um, so the background of this whole work, uh, food technology innovation, I think I should talk a little bit about that. What am I talking about? So I was quite fascinated four years ago about this growing Silicon Valley uh, food startup culture, the startup culture of foodpreneurs and and technologists having these bold claims about uh, revolution of food systems and food cultures through technology. Uh, so probably you have also noticed this sort of like growing amount of growing volume of different technologies that people use uh, in their everyday food lifestyle, such as the applications for sharing of food, reducing food waste, quantified self technologies to self check your diet and count your calories. Also the growing uh, number of AI technologies that are sort of trying to be more creative and smarter than you in terms of uh, gastronomy and, and recipe making and, and food creation. So this trend of from Silicon Valley to table, as I call it, is something that uh, that I was really interested in with, with the design research work. And, and I'm specifically looking at not only what kind of opportunities these technologies bring into the food cultures, but also the challenges and the risks. And I like to use this example of this sort of recent food tech innovation called Bodega, uh, which you can see here, if you can see it. Uh, it's an uh, innovative uh, design proposed by two ex-Googlers. Uh, this whole idea of, you know, we don't have time to go to grocery stores, we don't have time to go do our everyday shopping, so we should somehow, we should make it more effective, right? So they designed this um, system, this AI-driven food pantry that basically works on the basis of sensors and, and your app. So you come there, you unlock the pantry, which you can see here with an app. Um, it automatically recognizes you, you take something from the shelf, the sensors recognize what did you take, and that's it, that's your shopping. And the whole idea is that you can avoid the normal bodegas, the corner stores, the mom and pop stores uh, that we usually go to. And it was quite hilarious to watch the reaction of people uh, when this uh, solution was introduced, uh, because people got really quite angry <laughs> on social media, suggesting that, well, I do like to go to my bodega, I do like to talk to the grocer, and by the way, bodegas around the US are run by Latin Americans and people of Asian origin, so there is also the thing of you are kind of taking away the business from people who don't have many other opportunities, uh, job opportunities there, right? So um, I guess what I'm trying to say with this example is that this kind of innovative digital technologies are definitely good uh, in some ways, but they are also creating certain problems. And sometimes, rather than solving problems, they are actually making more problems. And 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 because I spent last four years in in the academic thing, this is a picture I took today from my from my window. It's not just a matter of Silicon Valley, right? We are doing it everywhere. Um, and and I'm looking specifically at the area of food research because I'm a food researcher. Uh, so I'm looking at how are we as food researchers, you know, reflecting on this growing role of technology in food cultures. And it's quite surprising that there is not much work done around it. Food studies, for instance, which is the flagship of contemporary food research, is really not very much interested in the role of technology. There is very, very low research around the use of discussion forums, that's all. Um, we have this new field called HFI, human food interaction, which is a subfield of human computer interaction. And interestingly, so I frame my work in that field, interestingly, we are all very techno-optimistic and technocentric and designing similar solutions as the Silicon Valley guys in our work. So that's something that was a sort of contention that I had in that thesis, that there is a room for more 
experimental, playful, critical, reflective type of food design research rather than designing new solutions. <coughs> and so the approach that I'm using, speculative design and speculative fiction is, as you probably know, is, is centered more around um, asking provocative questions and um, proposing food, um, what if food scenarios uh, and rather than solving issues, uh, sort of problematizing solutions. Um, and it's very often this type of design that is presented in art galleries as signature style, exhibitable, uh, authorial type of works. So, as I said, I like to work on the street, right? So, uh, I'm not doing that. Uh, what I do in the work is that I'm trying to bring speculative design on the street, that's it, and use it in more convivial settings to sort of break this whole idea of we can sit in a gallery and we can speculate about the world because that's how we are going to find out something interesting. I have sort of like counter uh, proposal that if you want to speculate about the everyday world, you might want to go to that everyday world, right? And ask the real people. Um, so I've been doing the Edible Speculations uh, project for last, I guess, almost 10 years. Uh, and it's really based around this idea of uh, working with food and technology and presenting all kinds of participatory food designs in everyday context. So we have, we have um, this food bistro where uh, homeless women use this uh, speculative algorithm to create storytelling dishes. We are eating tarot, food tarot about uh, possible food tech futures uh, on the streets. We have this project called uh, Bring Your Own Poop, which is this sort of fake laboratory where we are analyzing people's microbiomes uh, and talking about data security issues. I'm not going to talk about these um, projects um, in detail because I don't think I have time, but uh, we can talk about it later if you like. Um, and I will talk more about the parallel food futures because that's the thing that I have uh, back there. So the parallel food futures is, it's a food tarot oracle where I basically use the traditional tarot cards, specifically the Tarot de Marseille cards, uh, and translated them into food tarot cards, which are speculating about the possible futures of food science and technology. So each card is showing one speculative diet tribe, which is imagining how would you know people live in tribes and use technologies in their everyday food tasks. And each card is connected, uh, the, the meaning of each card is connected to the symbolic meaning of the original tarot card. So for instance, the tribe of datavores, which are those people using quantified self-technologies for self-tracking and self-quantification and logging uh, all their calories, uh, is connected to the card of emperor, uh, which in the Tarot de Marseille system refers to the urge to rule and control the world. And it's very often connected to the ultimate male ego in the Tarot system, which is pretty much similar thing with the quantified self-context where people are trying to rule their own bodies and control their own bodies through numbers and through data. And it's most of the ma male users, right? So, so yeah, this is the, this is the main principle of, of that food tarot thing. And that's how I created 22 different speculative diet tribes that are talking about different types of, you know, possible food futures, food tech futures. Um, so I do tarot readings, like one-to-one -one readings uh, in different settings, in workshop settings on a street, but also in this kind of like artsy settings. Uh, and yeah, if you come to that parlor, I would do a reading for you and then I would ask you to create a short scenario. Imagine that um, you are the speculative diet tribe, you're a member of that speculative diet tribe that you selected on your card and then you create a short scenario around that. And through that, I'm really trying to portray food problems, food technology problems and food techno solutionism as a personal problem. So the sort of like nudge to talk about uh, the food tech issues from personal perspective. So yeah, as I said, um, um, we have done the food parallel in a garden. This is in Utrecht, uh, this collaboration with uh, Creative Coding Utrecht. Um, at Maker Fair, this is Maker Fair Singapore, for instance. Um, also as a workshop prop, which was recently here in Melbourne, on a street, pretty much everywhere. Um, and also in a bar, like surprisingly, it's a very good thing to do in a bar. People just, you know, like to talk about their food futures when they drink, surprising. Um, so we can do it here as well, I guess, later. Um, or in a forest, this was one of the last readings I did. Uh, it was part of a workshop called Homo Sapiens, Fermenting Speculative Food Histories, where we lived together in a forest for one week and we were foraging for stuff, foraging for food around and then we were just fermenting it. And I was asking people to always select a card and 
create a scenario in a jar. So basically create a scenario of possible f food tech futures through the fermented jar and then write a short uh, speculative fiction story around that. And we spent a yeah, week doing it and it was pretty good. And also at the art, at different art exhibitions. I'm saying the art because I'm not artist and I always feel intimidated talking in front of artists, right? So I'm just saying it like that. Um, yeah, and, and, and that's pretty much it. So I said this already during the first uh, yarning session. Uh, I think that the way how I'm trying to use speculative design is in the sort of campfire context. So I like this quote from Laurie Anderson, who is saying that technology is the campfire around which we tell our stories. And this is a like, inspiration for me how to use speculative design, to really use it in the community settings and share the stories around that. And that's it. Hello, uh, my name is Claire Field. I work as a uh, independent curator, um, art consultant, and an artist. However, with um, my fine art practice, um, I graduated in Hobart in 2001, um, really focusing on uh, technologies of the time and looking at their, their kind of embedded physical coding um, from their packaging and printing those and having just a look at uh, the semiotics of what like, is on from the inside out of those objects. Um, at that time, I was quite monochromatic and black and white. I was kind of interested in the tech, uh, you know, positive, negative space and kind of the tensions between opposites. And since um, kind of revisiting those works and, um, and since 2001, uh, I didn't have a lot of documentation of those works other than on film because digital cameras were really expensive. Um, so it's been interesting, I guess, looking, since they're not having so much of a studio practice, but um, seeing technologies change, just the size of things, the packaging of things, and um, today was an opportunity for me to look at the mobile phone. I haven't actually unpacked it this way before. And for me, I guess, through uh, working in, uh, with feminist me methodologies and looking at binaries, I wanted to really embrace not just that, but just use colour, because I really like colour, and um, I feel that I wanted to experiment with these shapes and forms with a video exploring a visual coding and um, and something that's using colours that together sometimes are a little bit unstable. So, and, and, and colour actually can embody uh, or, or share mood. So I, I felt like, as well, you know, I've been so much using technology, I use Photoshop, I, I, you know, I've run a lot of, I guess that's why I've been doing a lot of curatorial work is because I can uh, do it on the computer, I'm a mum, it, it works, I can communicate from home, I can be <coughs> isolated. and. Um, and still get work done. And so studio practice is really hard with little kids. Uh, so this was an opportunity to get, I, I, do, I do collaborative works with them, but it's hard to actually focus on, you know, uh, more critical inquiry. Um, yeah, so I th then I just was realizing as I was making this, um, how even though I'm creative through technology and I use technology a lot in my um, practice, my, my uh, curatorial practice, um, I really miss the visceral, the making, the, the the actual, the painting of these things. And I haven't, uh, through, you know, more digital technologies, felt that kind of meditative, I, I mean, I think sometimes I go in my mind a bit, but not my body and as much. And so um, for me to do this with the mobile phone, it's actually really, like I'm having a great time out there. It's like I'm really relaxed. <laughs> and I'm enjoying color and playing with form and, um, you know, and, and exploring this because there's so many already combinations that I could do. Um, you know, I normally, when I do a work, do it on a quite a grand scale, so this is like, you know, I can, this should be massive. <laughs> I like to kind of build and build and build. I'd like to actually build a city, like, because at the moment these shapes are still, are still like, recognisable for me because I haven't built enough. I kind of want to abstract them more. Um, but yeah, that's, I guess that's what I'm doing out there. Um, it's new to me as well, um, as far as... Uh, what it looks like, but it, um, hopefully there'll be more iterations and different ways in which these shapes and forms will grow um, into sort of three-dimensional paintings and <laughs> and paintings and sculptures. So, um, yeah, if anyone's got any questions about those, I don't know if it's, it's just actually just an installation. You probably passed it. So, yeah, that's, that's that. I thought I would just do a little chat about some of the work that I've made in the past and maybe how it's changed <coughs> over time. 
Um, and it's always interesting to do these sorts of things because you can kind of see um, the threads that have stayed connected to all the different works that you've made, even if they have shifted quite a lot. Um, so as an artist, I'm really interested in uh, connectivity and the anxiety that it might create. Um, when I first started making installation work, I tended towards making these really big, kind of immersive uh, ambient spaces. And the idea in these spaces was that through um, audiovisual overload, you could sort of disconnect and disengage from your life. So um, I feel like, you know, our devices stress us out quite a lot. Um, but I also don't necessarily feel calm in those kind of, you know, white spaces with the strange music that plays, that kind of thing. They can kind of stress me out as well. I actually find being a little bit uh, overloaded and, and having lots of colour and audiovisual energy, I find that really kind of restorative and, um, and calming. So the early works I made um, used a lot of uh, video and mirrors and um, reflection, re reflection and diffraction to kind of make these shifting spaces that were kind of overwhelming and um, yeah, would act as like a threshold zone to help you disconnect from your everyday life. Um, I then, adjunct to that, I've done a lot of kind of projection work as well. And it's always been really interesting to see how those um, distorted and oversaturated uh, audiovisual textures can kind of disrupt an everyday environment. So um, yeah, this is a projection I did recently on the William Billy Bridge in Brisbane. And um, this is some stuff from Gertrude Street. And so, yeah, um, taking those kind of glitch textures and uh, saturated um, colours into those uh, external spaces is, is quite interesting. Um, I've also done a lot of work with uh, textiles. So I, um, I have a label where I work with um, different digital prints and um, holographic foil and um, machine embroidery and knitting machines to um, yeah, create garments that you can kind of uh, wear you know, your, your media anxiety on, on your body, out and about. Um, I thought I had another one in here. Oh no, I didn't put it in there, that's right. Um, so yeah, I feel like, you know, these earlier works were really uh, fixated on, I suppose, space um, and how I could use these audiovisual textures to kind of activate those spaces. Um, I then sort of started to realize, you know, obviously, most of my RSI and anxiety was coming directly from the device itself. So um, I started to become interested in ways that we could maybe um, use our devices to, to help uh, mediate the anxieties that they trigger. So I started to work with this series um, called RLX Tech. And so RLX Tech is like a speculative um, relaxation agency. Um, from a future where you can engage with on-demand relaxation technologies to kind of help you deal with your, um, your media anxiety. And so typically these have been um, augmented reality installations where there are kind of therapeutic homewares and things that you can have uh, in your house. And when you scan them with an app, they'll play guided meditations and provide restorative content. So to date, these things have been... Um, you know, up until this point, I feel they've been a bit tongue in cheek. So typically they play guided meditations to help you deal with, you know, no one liking your selfie or uh, having FOMO or being overwhelmed by the feed, um, being unfriended, all of these issues. Um, but I suppose I began to think about, um, you know, the fact that our attention is a, is a commodity and our anxieties themselves are as well. And at some point in the future, you know, uh, companies are going to begin to figure out how to monetize and capitalize on those anxieties more. So I've started to kind of make um, some different works that maybe explore um, perhaps less flippant or more meaningful um, connections with objects and technology. And so these are a few images from um, an artwork that I've just made. Uh, and so these are, um, again, working with these kind of speculative therapeutic homewares. Um, but these are uh, like laser cut discs 
um, using different mirrored acrylic and laser cut shell. And they actually um, are designed as like commemorative markers. So they'll take a significant life event and abstract and codify the things that have happened, the timelines or um, the names or the symbols of that event uh, into this kind of um, obscurely didactic object, which is then activated with uh, AR content to provide something um, that works and complements that. So it might be something restorative or something memorial or something to celebrate that particular event. Um, yeah, and so that's kind of where my work is at, at the moment. Um, yeah, and that's kind of all I have to say today. Yeah. <laughs>Just an observation for Kate, um, restorative content is such an awesome phrase. Yeah, well, you know, at some point, um, yeah, those are going to be like hashtags, right? And it's going to be sold to us and packaged to us. So I guess I'm interested to think about how we might um, claim that space before big companies do, if we can. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I just really liked, well to backtrack, recently I was at this um, conference thing and there were some of the world's leading futurists there, um, at least they, were, they seemed like they were left, they, they might have been in the 70s, so these guys are talking about <laughs> things of like, still talking about um, cryogenics and going beyond the omega point and, and all of this stuff and, um, and they were talking with such absolute certainty that you really had to like, you either believed it, you either were into it, or you weren't. Um, but I couldn't see it happening. But the thread here between um, between you two, Mark Edda and uh, several with names and Kate, okay. um, there seems to be a bit of this speculative future thing. And there's a couple of things in there which seem absurd, like at first, but I'm convinced that they'll be happening in the future. So I saw for you, I saw this celebrity meet. Eat, eat the celebrity. So let's say I, you know, let's say I can produce Matt Damon meat without harming Matt Damon, of course, in a genetic lab. People are going to buy that and eat that. There's a lot of fans out there. That, that is the step in the future that's going to come through. And, the, and this tomb, this isn't far away. Like I'm seeing a, a time when people walk in there. There's a full VR. You know, I might pass on, but I want to leave a message in VR for my future family. Um, generations. This is this is something which is going to happen, I'm sure. So, just for me, it was really interesting what this speculative um, fiction. You know, I, I, I like the process, but there's actually you know really tangible results that, that can come from there. So That's kind things. of the idea, though. It's like you're meant to operate like within. You're meant to operate within the realms of possibility and plausibility. So you're not really working with things that are impossible, like time travel or, I don't know. Um, and I think that's why they have the ability to connect with people, because they are operating in a very uh, clearly imaginable future space. So it's easy to understand how that might disrupt your everyday. Thank you. <coughs> Who else has a question for one of these? <coughs> Towards I don't know who it's too far. Too late. Too late. Why don't you? Why don't you? Um, I, like, I don't really have a question because like, I, I somehow just got the mic without <laughs> <laughs> having questions. <laughs> but I, like, I have more like this like, weird image in my brain when you were talking about um, speculative futures and digital interfaces and things like this. But one thing I really liked about your talk was that um, like the new language coming through, like getting unfriended and new social issues coming in and how digital interfaces interact with those new issues because obviously they didn't exist until the computer age or whatever. But um, I kind of imagine this speculative future of everything being shifted to this electrical grid system which fuels the computer. But then that the, all the like power resources of the world getting sucked dry, so <clears throat> technology becomes defunct, and 
going back to oral cultures, you know, like ancient cultures, and oral languages trying to get back to like prehistoric ways of living. But I wonder at what point these digital landscapes, because you know how you have the pyramid of the future, like if there is a future without the digital, or if the future is going to become digital continuously, well, it's not really a question, so. Um, <laughs> someone can say the comment. Can we move that? I think that the future without, without digital is the future for higher social classes. So you need to have enough resources to be able to get rid of the digital. That's a short comment. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, I had a question for Marketa. Um, as, as the self public ex public servant, um, I'm also really interested in community engagement and like kind of participatory stuff. And I was just really interested in how people responded to what you know would have probably seemed outlandish at first glance, like how people actually responded and engaged with this kind of speculative yeah, engagement process. Yeah, this is, it, it's quite interesting, really, and, and it's very different in different countries. And I, for instance, doing the food parlor uh, in Singapore and in the US, it's a completely different experience, you know, because people are just, they are allowed different public space to express themselves. So in Singapore, this place is very restricted. So people are not so much used to, you know, talking about and expressing their critique, expressing opinions. So usually it's pretty hard because you need to talk a lot and you need to really create a sort of welcoming environment. In US, I felt like I'm a shrink for these people. You know? They just came to me and they told me everything about their diets. And I was just like, okay, I'm just going to sit here and listen. So yeah, it's very different. And sometimes it's surprising. Sometimes you don't, you know. And here? I will see. <laughs> I didn't really have many uh, interactions yet, but yeah. Please go visit. I believe in the bar scene. When, when you I believe in the bar. We believe in the bar. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Nancy was a. No, nothing else. Uh, I was just saying. Like I was in the bar. Does anyone want to say anything else? Is it a hot surprise now? No, I just wanted to ask Claire um, one thing, probably a quick question, but you're talking about, um, you know, the familiarising, well, as, as I say, yourself with this ubiquitous object, which is this, this thing that probably most of us have in our pockets, the mobile phone. Um, so how, I mean, you're, you're sort of, I see, as, as breaking it apart and um, sort of, uh, you know, well, doing what you want with it, really. But I'm, I'm looking at that process and you're, and you're taking the different bits apart and treating them in ways which you, um, you know, are coming sort of uh, natural to your process. But what I want to know is, um, what does this sort of process afford for you? Is this something which is like a, like a um, carried out in, to gain some further understanding or control over an object which may seem like a black box object, which is a little bit mystified uh, uh, and understandable. Yeah, um, I, I guess what, what I'm actually inquiring is more about what surrounds it. Like, I mean, the mobile phone is so such an iconic object. Everyone has it. It's nearly becoming visible that like, everyone is holding one. It doesn't. No one seems to really mind anymore. Um, it's more about sort of the space around that, that this is sort of looking at the space surrounding that as though it could kind of carry and have a, um, a more subliminal language about what it actually is, what are the shapes that are there. And I'm, I guess it's kind of, I'm, I'm trying to, I feel like I'm cracking a code or, or trying to touch into an emotional space of it by, by the physical act of, you, of shaping it and colouring it. It, it feels like I'm, yeah, I guess trying to understand that, it, the, the space, the negative space around it, but as though there's more meaning, there's meaning that maybe that's around how the mobile phone affects us in, in bodily ways and communication ways that um, are happening now, but we're not totally aware of because we're too busy using the actual practical function of the phone. So it's, I guess it's a way of slowing it down, looking at it 
physically, it's um, what, what information doesn't come through by using it, um, what falls through the cracks and what does that look like. Um, I'm interested in, in how it breaks down and when the moulds don't work. Um, and that's sort of another way of it kind of having a different form and the different forms that come out of that. Um, but yeah, it's more of a, a mood physical thing that, that maybe will like, have a language to it that I'll, that'll make me feel uh, like I understand that technology more and its implications.